Someone asked me recently about where I was on 9-11. And I said, I don't know. Why? And he said, well, it was such a dramatic and such a catastrophic event. Most people remember where they were on 9-11. I said, not me. They said, well, don't you remember when you heard about it? I said, well, not really. I said, I, I kind of heard on the news that there was this, you know, plane that flew into a skyscraper. I said, well, that's interesting. And so I didn't really react that much. You know, I felt sorry for the people and I said a prayer, you know, said God helped them and God, I hope they were ready for, you know, meeting eternity. And God, I pray for the families, you know, because really the dead are already taken care of. Dover for them. But as far as the living, yeah, they need to deal with it. But I kind of don't react the same way to catastrophes the way other people do. And sometimes that frustrates some people. But you see, I kind of wonder about the thought process behind people when they wonder why I don't react. It's like, you know, the Oklahoma City bombings, you know, or maybe the Kent State shootings, or Vietnam, or all these things that have come upon the world. Lately, I think the, the latest one is the Boston bombings, you know. It's like, oh, and I'm like, well, no, because no offense. I think I was born for such a time as this. Because I was born into a time like this, I've been trained to expect these things to happen. You see, when I started telling people that Jesus was coming, I didn't expect it to be like you know, a rose garden. I expected like all hell to break loose. I expected that when Jesus said that you'll go through tribulations, that we would go through tribulations, that we would be challenged, that some of us would die, some of us would be martyrs, some of us would go through the very experiences of testing our faith to the limits that even Stephen himself would look at us and say, wow, they were men of God, for they lived in those latter days that they saw Jesus return in all his glory. So I don't really, I don't really react to circumstances. To me, one day is followed by another day, and every day is the same as far as I'm concerned. It's a day the Lord has made. The fact that a bombing happened yesterday means that there was something in that day that God allowed to happen for a purpose and a reason. And that reason may not make sense to you, but God already warned us ahead of time it was going to happen. So think of it this way. In the same way that you train for and plan for, you know, emergency response teams, you plan for the eventuality that you know because of your job that you're going to be the first responder. Well, because you know you're going to be the first responder, you practice over and over again each one of the catastrophes that could happen. So you're prepared for, in that moment of a catastrophe happening, you go in irregardless of your own safety. You respond to the need, you evaluate the circumstance, you take care of the immediate response required according to the needs of that moment at the time that it's occurring. I kind of call that a Christian, you know, I mean, that's what a Christian is, is a first responder. The Christian should be the person who knows ahead of time why these things happen or how these things happen. It's not just, oh, why do things, bad things happen to good people? That's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard of. Because Jesus said so, period. I mean, there was a, a circumstance in the day that Jesus was, you know, kind of like talking about these disasters. And it was one of the biggest disasters that had come upon Herodians, you know, that were building the temple at that time. And it was called the Tower of Siloam. And at that time, you know, oh boy, 
you know, there were people working on this giant tower that they were building that was going to be part of the temple and was going to be so beautiful. And as they were building it, the temple fell or the tower fell over and killed those that were working on it. And Jesus, knowing the thoughts of men, you know, confronted the situation and circumstances. Hey, look, which was it? Do you think that sin was involved in these men and that's why the tower of Siloam fell upon them? He says, no, it's for the glory of God. You know, and that Jesus confronted the issue that if God is in control of everything, then God's in control of nothing. Because quite frankly, you got the wrong kind of God you're serving. And that God uses these circumstances. He doesn't stand back and let, oh wow, you know, it's too bad. You know, the world's all corrupted. It's going to, you know, just happen the way it happens. You know, and I can't, I can count the hairs on your head, but I'm sorry, I can't be involved in those circumstances that Satan is the God of this world and, you know, I just got to back off and let things happen the way they do. Excuse me? I mean, I may not know all that God works out through trials and tribulations. I may not understand everything that God can use in every little nuance of every little crack of every little, you know, trial that a family goes to, even to the loss of a loved one or loss of a limb or the death and dying, you know, even like with the children that were dying at the time that Jesus was born. I may not understand all of it because my mind's not that big, but at least I can put a handle on it. God allowed it, period. If he doesn't, it can't happen. Period. He is sovereign. Otherwise, somebody's theology is more meology than theology. Because it's more about what I think than what God thinks. Because you see, one of the things God said way back when was, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Period. And I was like, well, that should go without saying. You're God. You created me. I'm not. I didn't create you. So guess what? <laughs> of course your thoughts are greater than my thoughts, bigger than my thoughts, not my thoughts. I'm just like an ant busy doing my anthill, and pardon me, but if somebody stepped on my anthill, I'd wonder, you know, what happened to the world? It was a catastrophe. No, you just go about doing what you're supposed to be doing. And that's kind of what a Christian should be prepared for ahead of times. You don't look at the catastrophe today or yesterday, like the Boston bombing, and say, <gasps> Whoa, whoa, it's me. What are we going to do? Uh, you should have been studying ahead of time. You should already know the answer. It shouldn't be a question of, well, now we have to reevaluate and, you know, all of a sudden get all excitable about a trial or tribulation that's come upon the world as was predicted by God. Since Jesus said these things were going to happen, we should already know what to do. And that's to trust in the Lord with all our heart. I mean, come on. You were born for such a time as this. You had more catastrophes in your life than the Boston bombing. I mean, there's been all kinds of everyday events going on in your city, in your neighborhood, in your location, in your nation, even in the places around the world that other Christians are living through circumstances that maybe you find <gasps> but come on now let's be real were you living in a bubble did you not read the word of god did you not go to church did you not open your bible did you not study these things to show thyself approved a workman that need not be ashamed or are you ashamed not knowing that this was going to happen you see it's not a shock to me you know, 9-11 or anything else that comes upon the world. As a matter of fact, I'm told that the Great Tribulation will be like no other time the world has ever seen or ever will again. So I know that's coming. And it's not here. And we're not going through it. We're going through what's called Tribulation. Not the Great Tribulation. When that comes, all hell breaks loose. So until then, you know, fathers losing, you know, their fatherhood and just being like, you know, children and acting like boys. Women, you know, no longer caring for their children or being mothers, but being like, you know, those that are discarding life itself. 
you know people losing in despair you know the reality of the knowledge of god and turning it into twisted images of their own making whether it be through dogs or cats that they worship or sports or some events you know that they are dictated by i don't know about you but i think the bible already covered all that i think we were born for this time i think we were taught to teach ourselves to train ourselves to be raised up as men and women of god for this time i think that when the catastrophe comes you should already be ready and you should be the first responders because if you don't have a reason for the hope that lies within you what are you doing just going along with the crowd you know are you running the race and suddenly a bomb blows you off your feet something goes off inside of your program and it destroys your idea of what the race was I'm sorry that's God it's a wake-up call the reality of the end of the world is come upon us it's not because the bombing yesterday or the Boston bombing or whatever or the Oklahoma City bombing or 9-11 or the embassy that was Black Panther blew up in America you know I mean come on let's go farther back I mean every time you go farther enough back you can find another catastrophe shoot that's not why it's the end of the world it's the end of the world because God said so and we we're supposed to be ready for it we we're supposed to be able to minister to those that need ministry at the time that they need the ministry and we should be prepared for that as first responders we should already be there mentally emotionally spiritually and moving forward to help others that with which we have also been prepared for in ministering the same grace that we've received to give grace to those that are in need because they don't know what's going on people in the world have no clue about the end of the world they have no clue about catastrophes when they happen they don't understand that God could still be in control and still love you even though you may have lost a limb or you may have lost a loved one Jesus said so. Jesus was the one who said, look, hey, no man that loves father or mother or house or home or any of these possessions more than me is worthy to be my disciple. But any man that is following me will get back house and home and family and friends and all these other things if you put me in my proper place. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So really, I, I, I don't react, you know, to those things the circumstances that oh wow I see those still you know and sadly you may think this is a little weird but those are opportunities to demonstrate your faith quite frankly it's a way to minister to someone who finally gets the message you need to get ready you know not just the Christians for ministering to others but those that aren't ready that may be unprepared for eternity they may be their last opportunity to hear the gospel or to know Jesus in a personal intimate way to find salvation before they die and they have condemnation which will happen after death because quite frankly if you don't have Jesus and you stand before a holy God you're going to wind up in an unholy place because you are unholy and the only place for corruption to go is in the lake of fire because that place will purge, cleanse, destroy, and annihilate continually, forever and ever, all that it was intended to do, which was really for angels in rebellion to God, not for those who should be in reception of God, to receive that which God wants to give to them of his mercy and grace and his loving kindness, that he would provide salvation through the death of his son. But if you're rejecting his son, Huh. what can I say so really when you consider catastrophes why the catastrophe is just the open door for you to demonstrate who you are what you are and where you are bottom line that's why no offense I don't I don't get overly zealous to dive into a catastrophe I don't get overly zealous to stay away from a catastrophe it's just one of those normal things that I say to you expect these things to get worse even as the end of the world comes upon us 
closer and closer the soon return of Jesus Christ unto his people to redeem them and also to spare some of them from the Great Tribulation. But some people are going to go into Great Tribulation. You know, 50 percent, we can figure out pretty easily that 50 percent looking for the rapture aren't going. You know, I'm sorry. Just the way the Bible says it. It's pretty clear. You know, it's like, well, one should be taken, and, you know, two should be in the field, one should be taken, the other left. That's pretty clear. It's pretty obvious. It's not like one person wasn't looking, you know. Hello? <laughs> Guess what? So, whether you go in, you know, the great tribulation, you know, dying as a martyr, or whether you go in the rapture, you know, spared of these things, one way or another, you got to know that it's going to get worse. You've got to be prepared for these things that are coming upon the world. It's kind of like when the weatherman tells you, like, today, it's going to blow. The wind's going to blow. It's going to be cold. I put on a coat. Hello. Duh. You know, I put up a tarp, protect my plants. I move them down from being blown over. Hello. That's what it is with Christianity. You know, you need to get a grip on what you think you know, your idea of why things happen as opposed to the actual reality of these things going to happen. Because God said bluntly, yes, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. For in the world you shall have tribulation. But not only have I overcome the world, but my peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you, but I give you my peace. The peace that has the reassurance that Jesus could look at what was coming upon his life, which was, quite frankly, one of the most agonizing, brutal, torturing events that could possibly be presented to a man. And Jesus to say, I'm willing to go there. And we would say, don't go there. Just like Peter, you know, to Jesus when he was getting ready to go into Jerusalem, knowing that he was going to die. Jesus says ahead of time, look, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. That's the way it is. It's unbelievable. I've already decided that. I've already been to the garden. You know, it's over. Peter says, no way. Uh-uh, dude. You know, we're, we'll, we'll spare you. No, you won't. Any more than you will spare anyone of your family or members or friends or anyone else from going through tribulations that God intends for either opportunities or learning experiences or something for us to discern from that we should grow in the knowledge of Jesus and grow in the grace that he's given us so that we would understand these things better than to react to them after the fact and make up stupid excuses that I've heard already some people say oh why do bad things happen to good people what good people hello Call no man good except your father in heaven. He's the only good there is, you know. Quite frankly, I think we need to get a grip on our theology and make it applicable to our life meology as we go through life every day, learning what the reality of life is. And that is God has said so. God has allowed so. And God has prepared you for such a time as this. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place where he should afterwards receive for an inheritance, obeyed. Whither he went, he knew not. It was enough for him to know that he went with God. He lent not so much upon the promises as upon the promiser. He looked not on the difficulties of his lot, but on the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God who had deigned to appoint his course and would certainly vindicate himself. O oh, what faith, this is thy work. These are thy possibilities. Contentment to sail with sealed orders. Because of the unwavering confidence in the wisdom of the Lord High Admiral, willing to rise up and leave all and follow Jesus. Because of the glad assurance that earth's best cannot bear comparison with heaven's least. It is by no means enough to set out cheerfully with your God on any venture of faith. Tear, tear into smallest pieces any itinerary for the journey with your imagination may have drawn up for you. The wind bloweth with her will. You neither know where it's coming from nor where it's going. So too is everyone led by the Spirit of God. Don't make your agenda God's will, but rather 
lose your agenda to follow God's will. Nothing will fall out as you expect. Your guide will keep to no beaten path. He will lead you by a way such as you have never dreamed of, and your eyes will look upon ever again. He knows no fear, and he expects you to fear nothing while he is with you. If God be for us, then who can be against us? But the reality of what God is doing is using you or changing you or developing you into his son, becoming like Jesus and likened unto God. In order to do that, he has the right, the privilege, and the purpose to do anything he wants to, at any time he wants to. You can exercise your freedom of choice and freedom of will and say all these things about what you think you can do. But just like the runners who had planned to finish the Boston Marathon, your plans will not go according to what you think, but according to what God wills. So today, when we operate in learning of our Lord Jesus, we need to really respect the whole fact of the matter that we need to pray accordingly as God has said to. Not my will, but thy will be done. For even as we have said, in Jesus' name, let's now go in Jesus' preparation, in Jesus' expectation, in the realization that God has a reason for everything under the sun. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to mourn, a time for sorrow, a time for the gospel, a time for not, a time to weep, a time to minister to those that are in need, a time to be prepared to minister to those that are in need. Because you were born for just such a time as this.